Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We're thankful that you're joining us for Hillsborough Church uh, virtual virtual church today, and we pray that you'll be blessed. Um, I have a few announcements, and uh, uh, next Sabbath will be our pastor's last Sabbath here, and uh, at uh, 2 to 3.30, you'll have an opportunity to um, express your appreciation for his 16 years of service to him and his family, and uh, it'll be here at the church, but it'll be a drive-by from 2 to 2.30. There'll be a place to uh, place cards. They are requiring mass and social justice distancing. And uh, if you can make it, we'd appreciate that you came by and, and encouraged the pastor that has served us for the past 16 years and his family too, that gave so much to this church. Um, in saying that, they're, they're having um, a little bit of a break before they move on to another church. So they're not with us this week. they have on vacation and uh, we pray that they'll be protected and uh, watched over and We'll be having a video uh, in the place called the, the Originals, Rivals Gods by uh, Ty Gibson. Also this week uh, kicks off virtual uh, camp meeting uh, July 21st through the 25th and uh, I encourage you to enjoy the meetings in the evenings or whenever, but um, you can go to the Oregon conference, uh, Oregon SDA conference website, and you can get the link there to, to be able to participate in the, the meetings. Also, I would like to encourage you to continue your tithe and offerings uh, to help support our church, but also to help um, things that the church are doing. And one of those is uh, our local mission missionary work and uh, I know the committee is w looking for a trailer. For, they bought one. And um, so we'll need to get our funds in to help them be able to pay for this. Um, okay. I oh, also wanted to let you know that um, Pastor Danny, first Sabbath at our virtual church will be um, August 8th. Uh, him and his wife Esther and and perhaps the two children will be able to be here and you'll be able to uh, see them online. I um, think that's about all the announcements I had. Uh, so at that we'll go into our music. Happy Sabbath. I have realized I'm spending way too much time at home and some of you are probably feeling the same way. And I have enjoyed coming this once a month to sing, but this is our last time. Emily and Sarah are moving on with their lives and this is the last time we'll sing together. Um, our first song is You Alone. As the deer panteth for
and Sarah introduced this song to us a month ago. I still don't know it real well, but it is an older song. Um, so maybe some of you know it better than I do, but feel free to sing along nice and loud out there. Wanna go to heaven and pick a never fading flower from the mountain overlooking the temple of my God. I wanna go to heaven where all is light and glory. How I long to be with Jesus. How I long to be with God. Sometimes I think I could stay here no longer. I feel very lonely for I've seen a better land. And oh, that I had wings like a dove, then would I fly away and be at rest. I want to go to heaven. for me. Sometimes I think I could stay here no longer. I feel very lonely here for I've seen a better land. And oh, that I had wings like a dove, then would I fly away and be at rest. I want to go to heaven, I want to hear the voice of Jesus. I will gird myself and serve you, for you suffered much for me. And when I get to heaven, I want to sit at Jesus' table, or to eat the fruit of that land, to go back to earth no more.
used to pick songs at home. This was the hymn that Bob always chose for our closing song so, in the garden. I come to the garden Now time. It is now time for prayer. I'd like to have you join me as we uh, go before the Lord. If you'll kneel with me. Dear Lord, we, we come before you this morning full of joy and happiness in seeing such a beautiful day that you've created, such a beautiful Sabbath day. And we're glad you do go with us through life, that you desire to lead us and guide us and to be close. And we desire that, dear Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with, with each member and be encouraging each member today and directing their lives. Help each member to have a closer relationship to you especially during these times of pandemics and, and uh, riots and 
unrest. Dear Lord, we, through this, we can see um, how the world can deter deteriorate really quickly. And we, we pray for your leading, giving our leaders wisdom and understanding. And we pray that they'll follow your will and be led by you. We also pray, dear Lord, for your soon coming, that, um, that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Dear Lord, we think of um, members that have had some illnesses. We think of Lori and pray that you'll continue to be with her. And Wanda, pray that you're with her and encouraging her. And I know there's many others, dear Lord, and just pray that each individual will feel your closeness and feel your healing if it's your will. Some are having financial problems and other things, and we just pray that you'll lead through all of that and help us in knowing and helping each other, we pray. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, we'll go to the Ty Gibson video. Question that if you are in touch at all with the prevailing culture around us, that you've noticed that there is an obsession right now and has been for a number of years with vampires. Now, vampire legend has it that if you go back far enough in the lineage of vampires, you will trace your way back to the originals, the original vampires. These are the humans that first transitioned from being humans into becoming vampires. Now there's something that you and I need to understand about this legend of transition from being humans to being vampires. There's something we need to let register in our minds. This is fiction. It's dark fiction, it's diabolical fiction, but it is fiction nonetheless. But the moment we recognize that, that these kinds of stories that we tell ourselves constitute fiction, the moment we realize we're dealing with fiction, in the next moment we realize that all of our fictions as human beings emerge from our eager and apprehensive interface with reality. In other words, there is a grain of truth in every fiction we tell ourselves. Or you could say it this way, I really think it's important to realize that our subconscious desires and fears show up in the stories that we tell ourselves. So what's happening when human beings craft stories, stories that in and of themselves in their big meta-narratives are untrue, those untrue stories are punctuated with truths that we're trying to face that we're trying to access and understand. In fact, I'm convinced that life is so difficult, life is so hard, and life is so absolutely frightening that there are truths that we can't tell ourselves except by means of fictions. And by means of our fictions, we're trying to access things and face things that really we're not willing to face unveiled, with an unveiled consciousness. So vampire legend, I think, has a grain of truth in it. It's telling us that, that there has been somewhere in the realm of reality a transition from good to bad. Just track with me for a minute here. Now, the transition from being humans to vampires is a fiction, but the biblical storyline tells us that there has been a transition from angels to demons. That, in fact, there was a period in ancient history, when a group of beings that occupied a very elevated status in God's universal government, in God's universal kingdom, that there, there were in fact an elevated, remarkably beautiful, intelligent category or order of beings that the Bible calls angels. And those angels, or a certain number of them as we're about to discover, transitioned and became what the Bible calls demons. So track with me here for a minute. When you read about demons in the Bible, 
You're reading about beings, creatures that were once beautiful and wise and remarkable creatures that bore in some way the image of God. In other words, they weren't always demons. They transitioned. Now, while vampire legend is in fact legend, the Bible claims to be telling us the one big nonfiction story. Now, it's up to you, it's up to me in assessing the biblical narrative to decide whether or not it makes sense and we want to believe it. I, for one, have found scripture to be true, and I want to tell you that it's not because I was raised with it, so it's not cultural. It wasn't passed on to me from my parents. I believe that the biblical narrative, the biblical storyline is true because I have analyzed it, tested it, and I see how clearly it does, in fact, reflect the reality of life as I experience it, as it happens to me. So we're launching into a series that I want to invite you to plug into, and we're calling the series Rival Gods. It's a strange title because right off the bat, we're thinking, well, there's only one God. How could there be any rivals? Well, we're about to find out that we live in a world, in a universe, in which there is, in fact, a great rivalry underway. There is, in fact, a great war, a cosmic conflict that is going down right now in our world and the universe at large. And in this series titled Rival Gods, we're going to be specifically giving our attention to the biblical notion, the biblical idea of idolatry. Everybody say the word idolatry. Idolatry. That's what we're going to be probing in this series, Rival Gods. We're going to be confronting three rival gods in particular. And as the series unfolds, you and I will begin to realize, it will begin to dawn on us that these are, in fact, rival deities, rival gods. We're going to be confronting the gods of power, money, and sex. And it doesn't take a whole lot of pause and just looking at the world around us to realize that these are, in fact, the most prominent idols, the most prominent gods that are constantly tugging at us for our worship, for our attention, for our affections. So part one of this series is called The Originals. We're going to look at three biblical witnesses. Now, it's important that you track with me, especially if you're taking notes. You'll want to take note of the fact that we're going to look at three biblical witnesses. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this so that you can know where we are in the process of our understanding tonight, because we're going, to be, we're going to be looking at a lot of material. And so it needs to be in bite-sized pieces in order for it to make sense, okay? So we're going to look at... Three biblical witnesses or three biblical accounts by three different prophets regarding this transition that occurred among the angelic order into demons. Three biblical witnesses, three biblical prophets. John, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. First, John. We're at the end of the Bible, the end of the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, and we have this incredibly cryptic, highly symbolic revelation in the book of Revelation. John, the prophet, has a vision, and he says, Behold, this is chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Apparently, we're dealing here with metaphor. He sees a dragon, but the dragon represents something or someone else, as we're about to see. And his tail, the tail of this dragon, drew, note the language, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So we have this vision of a dragon with a big tail and he draws a third of the stars of the night sky and throws them down to the ground. What are we talking about here? Well, John tells us in verses seven and eight, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his what, everybody? His angels fought, but they did not prevail, the dragon and his angels. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer, check this out, verse nine, so the great dragon was cast out, and now he's identified. That serpent of old, hold on to that language, we're coming back to it, called the devil and Satan. Now we have a conscious, sentient, volitional, rational being that is filling up the space in this metaphor called dragon. The dragon is a symbol for Satan, and he deceives the whole world. A universal hoodwink is going to go down. The whole human race is going to be hooly squagged by this great red dragon. A universal deception is going to go down in human history. And the whole world, the whole world will be deceived. And he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And now we know that not only is the dragon, the devil, Satan, 
But we know that the stars of heaven, that he drew a third of them with his tail, are angels. We know this from other texts of scripture that I won't give you right now, but the Bible uses the metaphor, the symbol of stars in the night sky to represent angels many times. That's the symbolism. So we have before us in this first account what we can summarize as an ancient angelic revolt, a rebellion of sorts. And this rebellion is led by one who is identified as a great red dragon, and he draws one-third, approximately, of the stars of heaven. This is symbolism for the fact that he led about one-third of the angels in rebellion with him. And so, we have before us an ancient angelic revolt. Now come to our second biblical witness, and that's Ezekiel. Ezekiel gives us an account of the transition that occurred between from angels to demons by specifically focusing in on some of the psychology that was going on in the mind of the head honcho in the rebellion. Satan, the devil, the one who is symbolized as the dragon who draws a third of the angels with him. He's the great influencer with a capital I who using his influence pulls with him into rebellion against God a third of the angelic population. Ezekiel delves into the thinking process and he does this by telling us a dual story. This is a literary mechanism that is common in scripture as well as other um, forms of storytelling down through history. This is a literary mechanism in which the prophet is telling us about the king of Tyre, a particular actual human earthly monarch, the king of Tyre. And as he's telling us about the king of Tyre and describing the aspirations and the mind and the thinking of the king of Tyre, he then at a certain point, and you'll see it, if you're watching for it, transitions into describing the fall of Lucifer. So he uses an earthly monarch to access a cosmic battle between good and evil. Your heart, king of Tyre, the prophet says, is lifted up. Note the language carefully because it's going to matter immensely as we continue to build tonight, okay? Your heart was lifted which way, everybody? Up. There's some kind of self-exaltation going on here. Your heart was lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, capital G. I am a God and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. In the Bible, seas are symbolic of peoples. We actually still use that kind of metaphor today. If you go to some kind of big event that's taking place, you might report to your friends, there, were, there was a sea of people there. Seas are symbolic of peoples. He's not wanting to float around in the midst of the ocean. He's saying, I wanna sit in the midst of the peoples. I wanna be the center of attention. He says, I'm a God, I sit in the seat of God. Well, to sit in the seat of God, what do you gotta do with God? You gotta remove him. You gotta displace the one in the seat in order to occupy the seat, yes? So I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the peoples. Yet, now we're out of the quote marks, now God through the prophet is addressing the audacious aspirations of this individual. Yet you are a man and not a God, though you have set your heart as the heart of God. You've got some lofty goals here, dude but your nature doesn't equate to what you're aspiring to. You wanna be God, but you're not God. <laughs> For years, Sue and I had this sign, I don't know where we got it, and I don't know what happened to it. I should have saved it, it was hanging on our bathroom wall for years so that everybody who went into the bathroom would see this amazing, amazing placard on our bathroom wall. Two foundational facts of human enlightenment. There is a God, and you are not him. Well, essentially, that's what the prophet Ezekiel is saying to the king of Tyre. You aspire to occupy the seat of God. You're not God. Now, check this out, you guys. Follow here. So even though you're aspiring to this position, it doesn't belong to you. Moreover, the word of the Lord, verses 11 and 12. Now, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation. What's a lamentation? A lamentation is a sad song, a dirge. Take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, to the king of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers, and I, God, established you as such. I put you in that position. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were perfect, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. This is pretty lofty language for some five foot 10 dude who lives in Tyre who became king, who's an egomaniac, 
seeking to rule and dominate his fellow human beings, suddenly we're talking about a being who was established by God as the covering cherub. Now, you have to be biblically literate to know what this language is referring to because the covering cherubs, this is language that is referring to the sanctuary in the most holy place and the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant with the two covering cherubs. This individual, King of Tyre, I think not, this individual occupied one of those two very highly exalted positions in the government of God. Whoever's being addressed here, we've made a transition from King of Tyre to covering cherub, and the covering cherub was perfect and beautiful and wise and occupied one of the two highest ranking positions in the kingdom of God until iniquity was found in him. Now we know that the prophet is introducing to us the fall of Lucifer. Now the thing that we need to keep in mind at this point is sometimes people will ask the question, did God create the devil? Did God create Satan? And based on this passage of scripture, we can give the answer, no. God didn't create Satan. God created Lucifer, and Lucifer created Satan. In other words, this highly exalted being, very intelligent and beautiful, possessing free will, the power of choice, he transitioned into a demonic being by his own choice. God made him beautiful, the seal of perfection, until iniquity was found in him. And how was this iniquity found in him? What's the deep, dark, diabolical psychology going on in his angelic noggin? You, your heart was lifted up, there's that language again, because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You did it, God didn't make you that way, you made yourself that way. And here in our second witness, summarizing, we see that a wise and beautiful angel turned his focus which way? Inward. Was he beautiful according to the biblical account? Yeah. Was he wise? Yeah. I think he's lost his wisdom at this point in the process. You can be intelligent and simultaneously unwise, yes? Have you ever known an educated idiot? Of course you have. Have you ever been an educated idiot? Do you know that it is possible to have a high IQ and to be a fool in your relationships? Well, this angel with superior wisdom turned his wisdom toward foolishness by focusing inward and he became obsessed with himself. And that brings us to Isaiah's witness. The account in the biblical narrative that Isaiah gives us, and I wanna prime you for this because I'm really hoping that you with me, that we will tune in to what's being said here because this is one of the most remarkable things that has ever been written in all that has ever been written in human history even outside of the biblical account. Take in all of human literature, everything anybody has ever written. And this is one of the most remarkable revelations ever given to the human race. So you really wanna tune in to Isaiah's account. Isaiah chapter 14, starting with verse four. We see that Isaiah is doing the same thing that Ezekiel did. He's using that literary mechanism, right? Where he begins by addressing earthly realities earthly personalities and then transitions in his poetry to address cosmic realities and cosmic personalities. So in verse four, notice, you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So the subject here at the beginning is the king of Babylon and here's what you're gonna say. Here's, God is speaking to Isaiah. Isaiah, you're my prophet, I want you to, I want you to say something to the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. It's poetry, so it's supposed to have a cadence to it. It's an exclamation, it's not a question, it's not asking how, it's a declaration, it's how has the oppressor ceased. The king of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon is in decline. That's what's being described here in the poem. And, and the issue is how is the king and the kingdom of Babylon in decline? Well, we're about to discover that one of the deep secrets of human psychology, one of the deep secrets of human history, one of the deep secrets of human theology is that always, always, always self-exaltation is an illusion that finally runs out of steam and you go down. Every effort to lift self up backfires and you end up having a situation in which your selfishness either is contagious so that others become selfish like you, which means they're not looking out for you and you're not looking out for them and the whole thing comes crashing down. Or 
your selfishness will be pierced with spiritual perception and people will begin to back up from supporting your little totalitarian regime in your home on Elm Street or at your business or wherever it is that you're trying to be the king of Babylon, you will find that people will either reflect your selfishness and will not be your allies anymore or they will see through your selfishness and begin backing up and will cease to support whatever it is that you're pursuing. Any way you slice the pizza, self-exaltation takes you down. So here's the question in verse four. How is it, I mean, it's a declaration, but now we're turning it into a question. How is it that the king of Babylon, the oppressor, is now ceasing and going down? Well then, that's the king of Babylon. When we go down to verse 12, after he's delineated, the characteristics of the king of Babylon. We come to verse 12 for the sake of time. I want you to read all of it. Read all the verses in between as the king of Babylon is described, but then the transition occurs in the literary mechanism from earthly realities being addressed to what again? Cosmic realities are now being addressed. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, Son of the morning, son of the dawn, another version says. Here now we're dealing with a luminous being who is the son of the dawn, I would suggest, of creation itself. That we are now dealing with a being who is among the first beings, if not the first being ever created by God the creator. And Lucifer is very much a reflection of the self-exaltating tendency of the king of Babylon. Actually, you could turn it around. The king of Babylon is reflecting the mind, the heart, the psychology of the first great self-exalting rebel, Lucifer. The question then can be derived from the declaration. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground. Notice he's exalting himself, but he's going down, you who weakened the nations. I want you to notice here, that Lucifer has had an effect on the what? The nations. Lucifer's way of being has been brought to the world and now composes the general way that we as human beings perceive ourselves and others and reality as a whole and our relationships on all levels, including on the national level. The fact is that Lucifer is exalting himself, but he's going down. Now, in the next couple of verses, we have a remarkable insight into the psychology of this fall, of this descent. For you have said in your heart, that is in your mind, your thinking and feeling process, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. What are stars again? We mentioned it earlier. Stars are a symbol for angels, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest sides of the north. This is biblical symbolism or poetry for the pinnacle of power, the farthest sides of the north. That's where, according to the Israelite way of thinking, that's where God's throne resides, in the farthest sides of the north. This is a poetic way of saying that Lucifer is aspiring to occupy the throne of God. I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. It's all upward language. We call this upward mobility in the corporate world. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Check this out, you guys. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. That word is the Hebrew word for grave. You will be brought down to the grave, to the lowest depths, the lowest depths of the pit. So what's happening here? What's happening here? Well, I want you to notice that in the poem that is describing the fall of Lucifer, we have an insight to the psychology of Lucifer. In other words, we're brought into the inner precincts of the dark machinations of his thinking and feeling process. He's aspiring up, 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 but eventually he comes which way? Down, there it is again. Now, in the poem, it's fascinating, there are five stanzas of self-exaltation, and the sixth stanza of the poem is complete destruction. In other words, there are five upward-reaching stanzas, I will exalt, 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 exalt myself, and then the prophet says, but you're coming down. But there's something else here. You'll notice that in the poem, which is descriptive of the psychology 
of Satan, of Lucifer and his fall, you'll notice in the poem that the fifth stanza of exaltation is unique among all of them. I will exalt, 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 exalt myself, and then I will be like the Most High. I'll be like God. Something's happening here. Something's happening here. I'm gonna suggest to you that this passage reveals to us that there are two fundamental components to the pathology of Lucifer, to his way of thinking and feeling and, and processing himself and others and ultimately God. I'm gonna to suggest to you that the passage reveals that deeply embedded within the Luciferian mind is narcissism and projection. Now by narcissism, that's the part where I will exalt, I will exalt, I will exalt, I will exalt, right? But the fifth stanza says, I will be like God. Now there's a few different ways you can say this. He could be saying, I want to be like God in position and power, but not in character. That's one way you could interpret the passage. There's another way, however, that you could interpret the passage. This first way of interpreting the passage, this, this way of simply saying that, that I want to exalt myself, exalt myself, exalt myself, and I ultimately want power but not character, the power of God but not the character of God, that would mean that the devil's rebellion is a fully conscious and therefore an overt pursuit of the throne of God. I'm gonna to suggest to you that his psychology, his pathology, the process of his thinking is more subtle and deceptive than that. He's pulling something that we're gonna call projection, but first, narcissism. Narcissism in the form that we're encountering it with Isaiah 14 is what we might call a God complex. And the dictionary defines God complex as uncontrolled narcissism inflated arrogance and a perceived need to subjugate, to dominate and to control others. No, this is not about your husband, this is about Lucifer. A God complex is narcissism gone completely wild and out of control and it is an aspiration to have everyone in your little world or your big world underneath you and you occupy the pinnacle of power over all others. This can happen in a home, this can happen at an office, this can happen in a nation, this can happen in a world. So what's happening here is Lucifer's narcissism, he's, he's basically, he is an egomaniac. He is, he's experiencing what we call megalomania. He's, he's so completely obsessed with himself that he can't even feel the feelings of anybody else. He can't think the thoughts of anybody else. But his narcissism, listen carefully now, this is the genius of the Isaiah passage. His narcissism is justified by projection. What do I mean by projection? Well, that is to say that Lucifer is saying, I'll exalt myself, I'll ascend, I'll lift myself up, I will live for myself, I'll be like God. He is attributing to God his own aspirations for self-exaltation. He is either imagining or he knows the truth more likely and he is pulling off the most colossal lie in all of universal history by leading a third of the angels and eventually the human race to believe that God is essentially self-centered. And if God is self-centered, that justifies my self-centeredness. I don't need to aspire to anything different than me, myself, and I. If the person who occupies the pinnacle of power in the universe himself is selfish, if he's not looking out for me, I've gotta look out for me, I've gotta look out for number one. Shakespeare in his masterwork, King Henry VIII, this is the best line from the entire play, in my opinion, says, suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. I want you just to ponder that for a minute with me. This is, this is a long time before Sigmund Freud came along and taught us about projection, the psychological phenomenon of projection. I'll suggest to you that the Bible understood it long before Freud and Shakespeare, and that's why we can comprehend these things. Shakespeare ingeniously, in a single line, encapsulates the diabolical darkness of projection when he says suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. Whatever is wrong with me that I'm not willing to face and rectify, I will project onto you to justify me retaining what I'm not willing to give up. If I'm a liar, Boy, I'm suspicious of you telling the truth. If I'm a thief and I've got my eye covetously on other people's stuff, well then, I'm assuming that my stuff is in danger 
of all of you other thieves. In other words, sin itself, evil, can only be perpetuated to the degree that you can cast blame outward on others. The moment you begin to realize that somebody else in your world, in the universe, is infinitely good, God namely, now you're called to account. Now you're responsible. Now there's something else going on, and the only proper response to goodness when evil in my own nature is faced is repentance. But if I'm not willing to repent, it is so convenient for me for you to be worse than me so I can keep being as bad as I am. So the human realm is brought to view in the biblical storyline because the fall of Lucifer was not contained to what Revelation 12 calls heaven, the heavenly realm, wherever that is, whatever that is. Some other location in the vast realm of reality, that angelic revolt, that rebellion, came to earth to the human realm. And Genesis 3 gives us the account of the fall of mankind. And if we track with it, we will see a, connective, a connecting thread. Now the serpent, pause right there, we know who the serpent is now, right? We just read about the serpent in Revelation chapter 12. The great red dragon who is the serpent, Satan, the devil. The symbolism has already been decoded for us, yes? So the serpent, the serpent was more subtle, more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said to the woman, who's addressing our first mother, Eve? Who's addressing the devil? Satan is using the serpent, I guess, as a medium of communication. And what did he say to her? Well, he said a number of things to her that climaxed with this thing. He essentially said in verses one through four, he essentially said, God is self-serving. He's only looking out for his best interest, so you had better look out for your best interest. You can't trust him, but if you'll follow me, if you'll do what I'm suggesting, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Does that sound familiar? It's super familiar because what we have before us now is Satan, the original God complex narcissist, fed the human mind with a lust for the deification of self in human nature. And in feeding that lust for the deification of self, we have before us the real core issue in this great rivalry that is going down, this great controversy that is going down in human history. Essentially, there are only two ways to be, two ways to live, two ways to exist, either with self as center or others as center. The biblical storyline is suggesting that God is love in the most infinite, beautiful, and extreme sense imaginable. That God is utterly and completely other-centered. And the only sustainable, eternal way to be is to live out the love of God with other-centeredness. The devil has introduced into the human mind and into human society the principle of selfishness. And once we begin to understand the contrast, the dichotomy, the war between these two orientations to reality, we understand everything we need to understand about what's going on in the world in microcosm. You may not have, I may not have all the facts about every case, but with this lens, everything can be discerned for what it is on all levels. And it is from this obsession with self that began among the angels and then transitioned among humans that we have in the biblical storyline, the biblical narrative, the emergence of idolatry. Now, idolatry, this is fascinating. Please track with me here. Idolatry, we generally think of as an ancient practice of ancient peoples in the ancient past. They made little statues or big statues of gold or silver or wood, and then they bowed down before them. But behind, listen, listen, listen now, behind every little figurine or big statue in the, in the nation of idolaters, behind every physical manifestation of idolatry, there is a demonic force working to transition human beings into demonic characters. And so Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 tells us that when the Most High, that's God, assigned lands to the nations... When he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the angelic beings. This is from the New Living Translation. Now watch this. Are you still with me tonight? You still with me? Okay, watch this now. God divided, just picture a map. 
The world is dividing up into nations and they're being divided up according to the number of the angelic beings. Another version says, the Living Bible says, according to the number of the supervision angels over individual nations. Another version says, according to the number of the gods, the gods. And another version says, according to the number of the various deities. But I thought there was only one God. Well, listen very carefully now. There's only one true God. And our world is haunted by false gods who are showing up in human affairs in order to drive human nature toward the deification of self and our deepest urges of self-centeredness and to efface the image of God from humanity. So that in chapter 32, verses 9 and 10 in the Septuagint, listen to this now, and his people, God's people, Jacob, became the portion of the Lord. All the other nations were given angelic supervisors, protectors over all the nations. But the Lord said Israel was to be the line of his inheritance. This is God taking out his chosen people in order to change the world, including all of those nations around Israel. He, that's God, maintained him. That's Israel as a nation, the corporate body, in the wilderness, in burning thirst and a dry land. He, that's God, led him, that's Israel as a corporate body, about and instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. So God is, God is presiding over Israel. While all the other nations are being governed by other forces. That's what the passage is telling us, but check this out. As an eagle would watch over her brood, his brood, and yearns over his young, receives them and spreads his wings like in protection and takes them up on his back, the Lord alone led them, that's Israel, and there was no strange what? No strange God among them. Well, who are these gods, these deities that are presiding over the various nations? Check this out. Verses 16 and 17, now from the New Living Translation, they stirred up his, that's God's jealousy, by worshiping foreign gods. They provoked his fury with detestable deeds. In our series, this will make more sense. There's a direct correlation between idolatry and detestable deeds. They offered sacrifices to demons, which were not God, to gods they had not known before, to new gods only recently arrived. What? To gods their ancestors never feared. What in the world are we reading here? We are reading an account, according to Moses, of idolatry, and according to Moses, idolatry has behind it demons who are masquerading as gods. So when you read in the biblical account of these false gods like Molech and Ishtar and Dagon and Baal, Throughout scripture, you'll read about false gods that are worshiped by the various nations and the detestable deeds that they do in the worship of their false gods. Moses tells us the deep, dark secret. They're not just little statues on shelves. They're not just big statues in city squares. There are demons behind the idols masquerading as gods. And then we have this account by David in Psalm, Psalm 106, and he's tracking with the history that we just read in Deuteronomy. They, Israel, who God had pulled apart from the nations and told them, you're only going to worship me, Yahweh, is the one and only true God. But they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. Idols are grammatically equated with what here? Demons and shed innocent blood. That's one of the detestable deeds that idolatry leads to, human sacrifice. The blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Clearly, we have here in the biblical story, summarizing now, that angels who have fallen in rebellion against God transitioned into demons and began to posture themselves as gods that are represented by idols. That's the thread in the biblical account. And in every instance of idolatry, one of three of the most base urges in human nature is becoming the object of worship. The deification of our basest urges for power over others, for money and materialism and things, 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 and more things to the hurt and oppression of others and expressions of human sexuality that are debasing and destructive. These are the gods of the nations. And then in great and I would even say infinite contrast, the Apostle Paul says, let this mind, this is Philippians chapter two, 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This mind. What have we just analyzed in our three biblical accounts or witnesses? With John, with Ezekiel, with Isaiah. What did we just delve into? The mind of Lucifer. The psychology of the fall of angels. The psychology of idolatry, in fact. And now we have the psychology of God. The mind of God. The mind of Christ. And how is the mind of Christ described? Well, exactly opposite to the way the mind of Lucifer was described to us. You remember the five stanzas of Isaiah's poem? I will exalt, 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 and then go which way? On the sixth stanza? Down. Here we're going to see that there are six stanzas moving in the opposite direction that lead to an opposite end effect. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did he occupy a high position? Yes or no? Yes, the highest possible position. But he didn't consider it robbery, something to be grasped or held onto to be equal with God. And here he goes, here he goes, the mind of Christ, the psychology of God. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is an ancient hymn, a song that was sung by the first Christians. And in this song, we have Jesus going which way? Down, 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 down. Six declarations of voluntary humility to be followed by, therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. In Christ, we see the true image of the one and only true God. And the true image of the one and only true God is an image of self-giving, self-sacrificing, other-centered, voluntary going down for the best good of all others, and that would be you and me. So here we are contemplating two ways of being, two ways to process reality with self-centeredness or other-centeredness. And we have the two great case studies before us. We have the fall of Lucifer, and we have the crucifixion of Christ. And in the crucifixion of Christ, we have the most beautiful revelation of the heart and mind of God that has ever been given in all of universal history. For all eternity into the future, we will find that in living in reference to him, we will live in reference to all others before ourselves. This is Rival Gods, part one. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, and brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we want to encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we want to invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.